Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC. Hello and welcome, at CC. Hello and welcome, at one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. There we go, rolling. I'm so impressed and, and, and respectful for people in the documentary world, you know, because they are taking the tools that can be used for so many things and in using it to tell important, meaningful stories. And, you know, I, I hope that, that for many out there that are struggling with the resources or are dealing with creative challenges or technical challenges, that their need and desire to tell the story they realize is, is a huge resource in and of itself. And to, and to use that towards the completion of your project. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 71. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Over the past decade, documentary films have really come to the forefront of cinema, broadcast television, and really an array of forms of digital distribution. And in the past handful of years alone, the documentary scope, it's really broadened with the long-form documentary, also known as docu-series. The popularity of series is like The Jinx, Making a Murderer, and Chef's Table. They've only solidified the viability of not having to contain your awesome documentary idea into one single 90-minute film. You'll remember a few weeks back, we had a conversation with popular Netflix series Wild Wild Country directors McLean and Chapman Way. In the episode, a lot of what we focused on revolved around this idea of turning a documentary film idea into a full-fledged docu-series with the intent of distributing to a known digital platform like, like a Netflix or a Hulu or an Amazon. Well, in large part due to the popularity of that episode, which, by the way, confirmed two things for us, that Wild Wild Country was going to be a massive success, and two, that Doc Lifers, you guys wanted to know more about producing a docu-series. So with all of that in mind, we've decided to double down on this idea of developing a documentary series for digital distribution for this week's episode. As part of this, I'm excited to bring with you a conversation that I had fairly recently with commercial and documentary producer Gary Kaut, who is the producer behind another recent Netflix docuseries, Flint Town. Gary's another pretty down-to-earth and humble guy who's been producing commercials and features for the better part of the past couple of decades based out of his home in Ashland, Oregon, a lifestyle choice that he and his family very consciously made after spending years working in both New York and L.A. But before we get to that conversation, I'd like to discuss with you five tips for producing your docu-series. This should get your docu-series juices properly primed so that when we have our conversation with Gary, we'll be able to hit the proverbial ground running, all cameras rolling, if you will. All of that coming up shortly here on The Documentary Life.
Okay, so let's get started on our doubling down of discussion of producing a long form documentary series. Here are five tips for producing your docu-series. Number one, a killer pitch. Now, I really kind of dread when people use the word killer when they're describing something, you know, really great or fantastic or when they want to boast about something. It's it, maybe it's me, but I can be a little snobbish about language and my musical tastes for that matter. But for whatever reason, when people say killer, it makes me want to pursue a quick exit from discussion with this person. But somehow, I'm finding usage of the word killer as an adjective very appropriate here. Because the idea here is to build out a pitch that is so darn good that you'll slay the dragons of distribution with your amazing idea for a docuseries. Yes, and I did say slay the dragons of distribution. That's pretty good. When you go into a meeting with a Netflix or a Hulu or Amazon acquisitions person or executive or whatever, you have to be able to convey to them that your idea is worthy of their consideration for funding of production or post-production. And you usually have a very limited amount of time to present to these people. So plan on building out a tight 10-minute presentation and then be ready for perhaps a lengthier discussion if, you're, if you should be so fortunate to be given more time for consideration. And part of this killer pitch is number two of these tips, which is you've got to have the sizzle reel, Doc Lifers. You've got to have a sizzle reel. The sizzle reel gives visual representation of what you'll be conveying in your pitch. And it's kind of like the adage of actions speak louder than words, right? You can sit there and tell an executive how amazing your docuseries idea is and why they should be the platform to jump on it while they can. But nothing is going to be more effective in this way than your sizzle. Your sizzle reel should consist of some of your finest moments from any filming that you've already done on the project. It should also consist of tidbits of story and thematic elements. What it should not do is tell a perfect story. We're not looking for a polished 10 minute documentary short. Save that for producing your documentary short and for the documentary film festivals. I've made this mistake before when I'm putting together you know, my, my video teaser or a work in progress when I'm applying for things like documentary grants. The problem is that it doesn't leave any room for, for imagination on the viewer's part. They see the full circle, you know, sort of completed, which even if just subconsciously, it doesn't allow for them to see even greater potential for how they might help your docuseries idea become, you know, the next big thing on, say, Netflix. While a potential funder or investor wants to feel that you have a great idea and that you, you have the ability to pull the series off, they also want to know that they will be able to have some financial and editorial input and that it's going to help your series reach that potential. Number three, don't make reality TV. While one can certainly see crossover between the genres of reality TV and a docu-series, it doesn't take much to see and feel the difference between the two types of filmmaking. Nowadays, one sets up a premise, often with commercial interests in mind, and hires the talent who will most interestingly, i.e. commercially, tell the story of the premise. Through the course of the telling of this story, many, many decisions are made by television producers, you know, either on the fly or based upon production meeting notes, you know, on things like story ideas, character arcs, locations, things like that, etc., etc. It, by nature, tends to emulate life a bit more, it, at times even becoming almost a caricature of life. Whereas this other idea has a premise, a few more major players, but with a much more documentary sensibility or, or approach to it. That is to say that, that while the characters certainly have story arcs, um, discussions and decisions are certainly made by the people making the series, the actual production of the series and what is being portrayed is a bit more true to life. Look, even if you've never worked in reality TV or seen any sort of behind the scenes, it doesn't take much for the layperson to note the subtle, and certainly not so subtle, differences between reality TV and, and a docuseries. If it seems that I'm saying this with judgment, that is that is not my intent, and, and I apologize for this. Thankfully, later on, Gary Kaut will be able to talk more fluently and certainly more diplomatically about the differences that I'm speaking of here between reality TV and, and long-form documentary. Number four on our tips for producing a docu-series is secure the rights to the story. 
The last thing that you want to do is spend a bunch of time researching your topic, filming interviews, maybe even editing a sizzle reel and, and meeting with potential investors, only to have your chief subject or subjects at some point tell you that they're no longer interested in having their story told in, on film. That they, in fact, have had a change of heart and, and no longer want to be a part of your film series. Or maybe even worse, tell you that they've decided to instead sell their story rights to, I don't know, HBO Documentary and thank you very much for your interest in your time. It's kind of a tricky thing securing rights for a documentary. And it's not one that, that we easily or readily think of as, as doc filmmakers. We often associate story rights with the feature film industry or... Um, buying the rights to a novel for for adaptation to the screen to the big screen but it's it's a thing in documentary as well and, and you should understand that not unlike making sure that you have personal releases for your subjects you want to make sure that you've something signed between you and your subject that allows you to tell their story this protects you from your subjects getting cold feet midway into production or from other entities swooping in when they catch wind of your project and telling the story themselves and I had a mixture of both scenarios play out on a doc project that a good friend and I were once doing about a potential Olympic wrestler. Trust me, it was an awful scenario where we'd spent you know, quite a bit of time filming with the subject in multiple locations around the country, only to have him not grant us rights to his story. He effectively completely handcuffed us when he decided that he should be making some money off of his story, even though we were very early on, very clear with our intentions and upfront, and, and he could clearly see that we were paying for the production out of our own pockets, driving to and from Idaho, flying to Oklahoma City for, for tournaments, sometimes doing the one-man crew thing. Um, he even not so subtly began mentioning that HBO Sports was inquiring about his story. We eventually had to give him a deadline on which he could sign or not sign the release. He missed the deadline by about 12 hours. And we decided that that was too much. That, that working with him would, would clearly, that was a, a sign that it was going to become too difficult or maybe even a liability. And so, unfortunately, this project that we were very into and hopeful for, it never came to fruition. And for the record, nor did any HBO sports deal happen or a documentary about this person ever get made. I don't want this situation to ever happen to you, my fellow doc lifer. So you have a decision to make here. Yes, most of us recognize that giving monies to a documentary story is a matter of documentary filmmaking ethics. However, maybe we're all being also a little naive if we don't think there is sometimes some exchange of money that is happening. I don't know, and this is just for me personally. I decided for myself a long time ago that I would not be paying any direct money to subjects that I was making a documentary about. Sure, I could help with the occasional meal or travel costs, but beyond that, that, that was never going to be part of the deal. For myself, I believed it could change the nature of the relationship, and so I didn't want to do that. You may feel differently about this and, in fact, feel that I'm the naive one. That's totally cool. Regardless of where you might fall on this subject, you must get something in document form written up that allows you to be the person or the company telling someone's story. You've got to protect yourself or risk losing your doc project, you know, potentially after you've already invested substantial time and money into the effort. Lastly, number five, be friendly but don't be their friends. This is a pretty good rule to follow when doing any sort of documentary venture, and I'm sure we've mentioned it before here on the program, but it is worth uh, mentioning again, and certainly when discussing tips for your doc series. You're going to be spending a lot of time with your subject or subjects, so it's pretty understandable if you're friendly with them. And why wouldn't you? You're going to be spending an extraordinary amount of time documenting, dare I say intruding, <laughs> upon their lives. It's only natural to be taking their well-being into account throughout production. But there is a risk if you get too close to your subjects that some important content decisions will be made that can negatively impact the potential of your series to tell a really in-depth and thoughtful story. You don't have to completely remove yourself from interaction with your subject, though that's certainly an option and one that you know many a, a doc filmmaker has taken. But you can minimize the amount of interaction in a way that allows a story to play out or a subject's life to continue as, as realistically or as unfettered as possible. 
And not to disparage reality TV again, I will point out that the opposite of this approach is often how reality TV is conducted nowadays, you know, where producers and camera ops are often very engaged with shaping actions of their subjects. Now, reality TV wasn't necessarily always like this. We had on Doc Filmmaker and good friend of the show, Brian Kimmel, on the program last summer, and he was talking about how, as a Doc Filmmaker, he loved working reality TV in the early days, that it allowed him, you know, some interesting deeper character and story development, which was a nice option to um, to sort of the normal, regular sort of commercial TV. But how that had changed over the course of time and it devolved, if you will, into sensibilities and approaches that were actually quite counter to documentary. In fact, to the point where he wasn't really any longer interested in working in reality TV. So consider how and the type of interactions that you may or may not want to be having with your docu-series subjects. Your story will be thankful for it. So those are five tips for producing your docu-series. I hope that these have perhaps sparked some ideas for you as you think about ways to produce your own doc series. And I know that there are a number of you who are very interested in perhaps expanding their doc idea into the long form. If you'd like to see these tips written out, I'll post this list up in the show notes for this episode. Simply visit our website by going to thedocumentarylife.com. All right, next up, let's talk with the producer of Netflix's Flint Town, a docuseries that has done very well following members of its police force in a town that's been devastated by years of economic downturn, not to mention a certain water crisis debacle. My conversation with Gary Kaut next up on The Documentary Life. Over the last few years, as we've met and connected with more and more doc lifers, we've been asked what the most comprehensive doc filmmaking course out there is. The truth is, we didn't believe there was one. There are plenty of videos and some courses that walk you through some technical aspects of filmmaking and workshops that cover some of the business aspects, but there was nothing that specifically took the doc filmmaker through the whole actual doc filmmaking journey, both creative and business, from A to Z. That is, until we created one. The Documentary Academy is the only all-in-one online documentary film production course that actually starts from the beginning of your film's journey, from story conception, through pre-production and actual production, to post-production, and through to the promotions, marketing, and distribution of your film. The Academy will help you make your most successful documentary film by guiding you on the journey from conception to launch. But don't just take our word for it. Have a look for yourself by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy and discover everything that the Academy has to offer, including a video that takes you inside the Academy for a look around. The Documentary Academy has already greatly helped others realize their power and potential as doc filmmakers. Why not be the next person who brings an awesome documentary film to life? Head on over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy today, and we'll see you there. I'd like to welcome on the program producer Gary Kaut. Gary has recently been the producer on the hit Netflix docu-series Flint Town. Gary, welcome to the Documentary Life. Excited to speak with you. Thank you, Chris. Very excited to be here and to speak with you as well. So let's hear a little bit about your journey, Gary, because you didn't start out in documentary, certainly at all. Your your world was a very commercial one, was it not? It was. And of course, that wasn't where I originally intended to go. Mm. Um, I sort of fell into that uh, very early on in my career. And I would say the opposite at the now in my career, many years later, I have now fallen into documentaries. Mm. Was documentary something that you had initially wanted to do, or because you, you, it sounds like commercial wasn't what what you initially had set out to do? What what were you were you more narrative or documentary, or, or what were you thinking? Well, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. and it's where I started making films, short films, as a student. I actually made my first 
film in sixth grade. And it was really just a study in screen direction. It wasn't even an entire, the entire class that was doing it. I think the teacher asked if somebody wanted to take this camera they had. And um, so it was a little study of right to left, left to right, two characters coming together and uh, starring my brother and a friend. And, and then through high school, eighth grade, ninth grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, I continued to do more video projects, including some summer programs. But Growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, all I really realized of the industry, because it was way before uh, what's going on there now, yeah, was huge. huge, absolutely huge. But a few things had been shot in Atlanta before. In fact, I was an extra on a action film, Chuck Norris action film called Invasion USA. Awesome, ironically, awesome. That yeah. will make my brother happy if he listens to this. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was an extra in the mall scenes, and then they blew up the mall. Uh, and then in, ironically, years later, uh, I, I line produced a film with the same DP. No way. Um, <laughs> uh, I asked him if he remembered me, but anyway, so. <laughs> and he lied and said, of course he did. <laughs> of course. I, all I knew was movies, television shows yeah. in terms of like the, a career in film. Of course I watched television. So I saw television yeah. commercials left and right, but I never really thought of it as a part of the industry, much less. A career, right? So, documentaries. You know, I, I'd seen some documentaries for sure. Certainly watched a lot of nature shows and things like that yeah. uh, that were on television. Those I think fit into the you know nonfiction world um, more. I'd say than the term documentary is. Right. I think we we think of it in this context, but uh, but not narrative. Anyway, so off I go to film school. I leave film school. I go to New York City. I'm working on a low-budget independent film uh, as a production assistant. Yep. And it was great. I loved it. I mean, it's uh, independent film was where I was. What I was more interested in than okay. big-budget Hollywood films. Yes. I liked watching, and I still enjoy watching big-budget Hollywood films. But I also love watching small independent films and foreign films. And in terms of making movies, I just felt like I'd probably enjoy making the indies more than than big Hollywood films. I went to a film school in LA, but yeah. then I left and I went to New York because right. New York was the center of independent film. Absolutely. So so here I am working on this low budget independent film, freezing my my took us off in the winter in New York doing fire watch, you know, while the crew went for lunch <laughs> and grabbing a sound blanket and trying to stay warm and working in a tenement building in the Lower East Side. And again, very low budget, you know, one motor home for the entire crew and cast yeah. and, and, you know, one production cube to shove everything in, um, <laughs> doing lock up. And yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, anyway, yeah. the producer of that film who I met on that working on it turns out was a commercial production coordinator or production manager. Mm. And she said to me and another friend of mine who we've stayed good friends ever since, she said, you guys are awesome. Uh, normally I, I do commercials. I'd love to have you work on those. If you're interested, you'll make twice as much, you know, so I went from $50 a day, <laughs> $50 a day to $100 a day yep. working in commercials. And I thought to myself, commercials, hmm, interesting. All right, well, let's give that a try. Yeah. So here it is. Over 25 years later, and you know, after PAing, then coordinating, then production managing, then line producing, I have worked on easily yeah. over 300, 400 big national level broadcast commercials. And of course, in the most recent years, it's been a lot of corporate yeah. and web based stuff as well. Uh, but still, along that same kind of, com I put it in the commercial industry side of, of the film industry. I can't say with positivity, Gary, but you may have been, it may have been on, on one of the jobs that you were producing. That was my first, one of my first ever PA jobs. I think it yeah, was. I was trying to remember which, which I one don't was know, that. Man. I think it was one I, of the, you know, one of the many, many com car commercials that were being shot during the summer in, 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 in Portland, in and out of Portland. I don't know if it would have been that. Uh, actually, I've done a bunch of car spots yeah. but not actually in portland oh okay then maybe it wasn't it maybe it maybe. wasn't but it was definitely something yes and, uh, and then i know we, we we kept in touch and and um i remember seeing your documentary as it was getting done that you were working on and i have always just had a profound respect for those of us in the industry 
uh, and probably less so me, more people like you, who are, you know, they have their, their gig, you know, they have their job that pays them money and pays the bills and mm. earns them a living. Mm. And on the side, they're doing a passion project or a spec project or developing something um, you know, which may have a commercial side to it and, you know, may hopefully be a money maker or it just may be a calling or, you know, some, uh, inner need to, to tell a story. And to be honest, <clears throat> that doesn't, that, that wasn't me. Right. Right. Um, I, I, again, I love independent films. I love documentaries. Um, but I was staying busy in commercials and those were fun and short, you know, the commitment level is a little lower. Um, you know, I was, I was more of a cog in the wheel, although as I worked my way up the ladder, I I had more control over that wheel and then being able to finally kind of work with the the director and the director of photography and the production designer and, and wardrobe and, you know, the people who are making the creative decisions and really say, okay, you know what? I am a filmmaker. I've been, I'm a, I've probably been making films longer than, you know, most of these people. Absolutely. And, you know, many people come to this later in life, uh, even if later is only in or after college, mm. but I, I've been in a way longer. So I did definitely consider myself a filmmaker. Yeah. I just needed to find both my, my niche and what I'm good at. And I think that's super important, you know, for anyone in this industry is yeah. be honest, steer towards that, which you actually are good at. And then finally, I can start to bring my creativity into it, but at the appropriate, in the appropriate way, you know, as, as a producer to help. And I always say is, I'm not the person who comes up with the dreams. I'm just the person who makes the dreams real. That's totally, absolutely. And God love you. We need you, man. <laughs> we need you. Now, Gary, how did documentary start to become to be for you? So one of the people I met along my journey working in commercials was a woman in San Francisco, and she was my production manager. And her husband was developing his career in film as a director, and he was repped by a production company in Los Angeles, and they had a project that they felt was was pretty ambitious for for them at the time. And this was in 2011. Mm. And it was a commercial for Chevy where we pushed a car out of a plane and parachuted it to the ground. It was a Super Bowl spot. Uh, for Chevy and it was super intense and uh, it was my first job with the directing team as Mm. it turned out of Dre Cooper and Zach Canapari by the moniker ZCDC (laughs) Great. (laughs) and you know to me they were you know a a commercial directing team and we hit it off and I ended up doing we did a Chevy follow-up soon after and and then we started working for Apple but what I didn't realize is that these guys are also really into documentary Ah. and they had a documentary series called California is a place, which actually has some, um, kind of notoriety in the documentary world. Uh, they'd been in many festivals with their short films. Basically it's a series of short films just about, you know, California. Right. Um, really interesting, beautifully shot, um, very visual, uh, very atmospheric and they'd done really well in festivals. And so as I was meeting them, they had kind of already had that established and it turns out they had started developing their first feature documentary, mm. which became the feature doc T-Rex. And that's uh, currently, on, currently on Netflix as well. Yes. And they were still shooting it while we were working on some of these commercial and corporate video projects. And I found myself not just getting intrigued by this documentary that they were working on, but yeah. finding opportunities to actually help with it. Um, first, it was just helping them juggle their schedule. Right. Know, we're in the middle of an after job, and Clarissa Shields, the boxer in yeah. the film, yeah. is going to be in in China com- qualifying for the Olympics, and Zach is going to go and shoot that. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're in the middle of this other project. So, so I, I sort of found myself getting involved on that level. And then there was a sequence we wanted to shoot for the film that was Clarissa boxing in falling snow in slow motion. Mm. And they asked me if I would produce that piece for them, you know, more line producer and did. And then 
we start editing and, you know, watching the edit. And, and then we finish the film. It comes time to negotiate the rights with the Olympics for some of the footage we wanted to use. So yeah. I, I tackled that. And then we started getting some distributor contracts. And I started helping them with that and with the Netflix agreement, uh, with, you know, because, like I said, it's on Netflix now. And that was just a, your typical licensing agreement. And that kind of was my first real solid credit, if you will, on a documentary. Well, and I'm assuming that, be, I mean, T-Rex, from what I remember, that, that also takes place in Flint, Michigan. Are, 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 mm-hmm. are Dre and Zach from Flint? Is that their connection to Flint? <laughs> no, not at all. Amazing. Their connection to Flint is T-Rex. So they spent a lot of time in Flint, and they really developed uh, an, an affinity for the town, a love for the town and its people. And so a couple years later, we continued to do commercial work and corporate work uh, with uh, with me and, and Zach and Dre. And then things started happening around the country <clears throat> regarding policing. You know, first it was Ferguson, really it was kind of the first, or, you know, Michael Brown. And then there was Freddie Gray mm-hmm. and and uh, Eric Brown, you know, and Trayvon Martin, which wasn't exactly a policing issue, but certainly uh, related. Yes. And, and all of these things were just popping up all over the country and and and, and there was a, a, a lot going on around that and around that time it had been a few years since t-rex and since then we just kind of been buried in the commercial world with a few short docs sprinkled in here and there and they thought hey why don't we do something that talks that, they, that kind of addresses this issue of of policing and why not Flint, right? I mean, we know the town. They know us. Yeah. We've got you know some goodwill there. It can't be easy to be a police officer there for sure. And um, you know nothing to the nothing had happened to the level of this national spotlight. Um, fortunately, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, you know maybe we can kind of use this as a as a case study. And they asked if I would be a part of it, and I said, yeah, absolutely. Flint is an average by a long shot. It's hard to step out of your own skin and realize that this isn't what everyone else is dealing with. I mean, every system has a breaking point, and I don't know where ours is. Flint. It was a great place to grow up. The home of the middle class. And then things kind of changed. Did they change quick? You're all right, okay? We are inundated by violence. There's just not enough of us. Poverty breeds crime. Then you throw in there a water crisis. How is there not civil unrest? Motherfucker. My my question for you is is policing Flint the short the short it, was the intent to make a short film or were they making a short film to then per- perhaps produce something bigger um, once maybe policing Flint was perhaps used as a calling card what, what was the intent here? Well, policing Flint it's important to note is a VR film. Ah. Yeah, it is it is entirely in VR three hundred and sixty. It was. Produced for yeah. uh, the New York Times, um, Zach and Dre have done a bit of work for them, their robot series, for example, and and so we approached them and said, hey, we're in Flint, you know, we're kind of learning some very interesting things about the police and the community, and of yeah. course now the water crisis is happening. We're really, you know, we've seen you've been you've been producing some films in VR or providing a platform for VR. They have their own app, MIT VR, uh, is an app for uh, for for the smartphones, could we do something for you? And they said, <laughs> yeah, sure, sounds, sounds good. Um, so we went into it, uh, you know, and so we got the VR camera and we did some yeah. crazy f- stuff with it and uh, super intense stuff and I was there for, for all of that. Uh, it was about a week of filming. But at the same time, we also had a lot of assets that were 2D that we were capturing, again, not fully knowing what it was going to end up being mm. uh, or turn out to be. So we incorporated some of the 2D into the into okay. the 3D concept, uh, which was actually really really cool. We were working with a great technologist out of NYU, and uh, but anyway, it, it, Policing Flint ended up kind of being that proof of concept for us at least that we think we really had something with this 
with this content. And so we, we cut what we had in, in a, from our 2D shooting, which had, had been continuing, and, and it was now spring of 2016, uh, into a teaser, and cut it into a teaser. Dre Cooper, one of the editors, who's a, uh, one of the directors, who's a great editor, cut a teaser, and we said, all right, what do we do next? You know, where do we, what should we do? What should we do? We've been funding this really out of our own pockets at this point with airfares and hotels and, yeah. and hard drives and things like that. And, uh, you know, if we're going to make this thing bigger, um, maybe it's going to be a feature film, maybe it's going to be a series. We weren't sure, but, you know. You knew you had something that, you, that was bigger, that you knew you had something that you wanted to continue with, it sounds like here. Yeah, after... After a couple of months of shooting and doing policing plant, we felt we You're really right. yeah. we've really got something here. There, there's something. We need more filming certainly to get at it. We need to focus in. We need more resources. Um, where do we find them? <clears throat> you know, and and that question led us to well, I guess it depends on what we want to do with this. If we want it to be a feature film, you know, we need private investors. Maybe we can get some institutional money. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> write some grants. You know, uh, maybe ITBS had supported T-Rex, maybe ITBS, PBS, or maybe we want to go bigger and make this mm. more of a maybe a series and approach some of the streamers who, of course, had been uh, doing original content. And but we didn't. We knew some people, and we knew some people who knew some people. But the reality is, we're independent filmmakers doing this on our own, and it's kind of hard to knock on those doors when when that's you. Um, we kind of needed a, an intermediary. We needed we needed a partner. So, Anonymous Content, who is a you know big powerhouse production company in Los Angeles, the owner, executive producer Steve Golan has you know incredible <laughs> filmography, several Academy Awards and, and Emmys, and they were launching a, a more <clears throat> specific uh, unscripted uh -huh. division, and we had met the. Ex producer of that new unscripted division and he thought what we had was certainly strong and we said you know where should we take this we all agreed let's start with Netflix so we went to Netflix and they they said yeah we we think this is interesting too um, then became a pretty long process of negotiations contracts um, budgets um, Anonymous was very helpful with that, brought a line producer on who took our preliminary budgets and really fleshed them out and came from the, the television network world. So he knew um, a bit more about mm -hmm. how this process works than we did. And again, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of productions, but never a exactly. episodic documentary exactly. series. You know, it's always something new. As long as I've been doing this, you know, uh, wow, wow, there's always yeah. going to be something new. Anyway, so so that took a little while. In the meantime, we're still filming because at this point we kind of had a concept of this mm -hmm. is going to be a year mm -hmm. in the life of, if you will. You know, we started filming at the end of 2015. You know, we get to kind of see this going until the end of 2016. There's a seasonal arc to it. Um, and, you know, now it's summer and it's warm and hot and muggy. Yeah, it's really Michigan hot in and muggy summer. in Flint, you know. And look, you yeah. know, criminals don't like the cold either. You know, cold and snow yeah, can yeah, deter yeah. crime. Um, but now, you know, the, it's laid out. I mean, it's, it's light out late. So crime's going to heat up. So we got we to gotta film this. Plus, there was so much happening in Flint with the water crisis, the new police chief. I don't yeah. want to give away any spoilers. Um, but there was a lot happening. There was political stuff happening. There was the political election. The 2016 oh, national oh, election was happening. Um, oh, yeah. It was just, I mean a shit show you know can i say that um, yeah yeah and it's just like perfect for you guys yeah it was incredible but at the same time we're still funding this out of our own pockets so you know, trying to like you know get a, get other work to you know to make money and then we could spend a little bit of it you know on this and go to flint and stay for a week and you know, maybe bring another it's entirely unsupported it was the director with a camera some batteries some cards and some lenses and a shoulder bag and and a and a couple lobs that would that were wireless that would go straight into the camera, Canon C three hundreds, awesome, incredible, beautiful camera. So while we're waiting for everything to get finished up with Netflix so that we could get the funds, um, we had to continue this way. At times it was it was frustrating because we knew that things were happening that were missing. We knew that we needed more boots on the ground, and then then finally it happened, and. 
the money came in and it was like, you know, like a horse race with the gates opening and it is mm. full speed ahead. Mm. We, we rented out like the bottom floor yeah. of the hotel we'd been staying at so we could have a permanent interview set up in one of the conference rooms. Um, the other one was a meeting room. We had a, a room next to that for our production office. We, you know, we had crew rooms throughout the hotel. Now we didn't get huge. It didn't right. get like, you know, feature film, television show, huge by any means. Um, we brought on, uh, we tried to have a shooting contingent of four to six people now at, any, right. at, at, at all times. You know, sometimes you know, director had to leave or wanted to leave or take a break. You know, sometimes one of the one of the camera people we yeah. brought in had something they had to go do. So we just had a bit of a rotation, but we had a go-to pool of people um, that we would keep flying in, um, and so we could always, like I said, always from middle of okay. September to the end of December yeah. to just before Christmas, have a constant good-sized presence. We had yeah. our drone guy coming in and out um, to get drone stuff. Um, and then we had, we had you know, media manager and PA and and um, and some grips and electrics. When we did a few right. setups, that like our interview setup, and we did a sequence with some uh, a police quartet that we wanted to kind of shoot a little bit more stylized, you know. But so it's, it, I would say it still stayed that very intimate run and gun. We bought bulletproof vests for all the shooters and directors, um, yeah. you know, which we hadn't had. Um, and I and I came in, you know, as, as a producer. One of my jobs yeah. is, is protecting liability, and uh, and I was like, so I, yeah, found a local company that sold bulletproof vests and drove down there and picked them up, and we we put pink tape, <laughs> said media on it, and uh, and and we made sure that every time they went out, they they were they were wearing. Yeah, well, <laughs> they were, and if you see the show, in real, you know, my our guys, our shooters, the directors, and in our in our in our camera people were yeah. you know they were there well that's so just it, that's just it Gary and I'm going to stop you there for a minute that, that that's just it and it's something that struck me early on with the program is that what you have described the necessity of really manning your camera operators and your directors and and yourself with bulletproof vests when you see this by by the second you know third episode you realize there in terms of timing and certainly the time of the year and where you are in Flint Michigan and being so short staffed in the ranks of the police it it's it's there are moments where it feels like a war zone it feels like you're watching a war documentary and i'm not exaggerating am i no i mean I think the the style of the show and, and, and the editorial, you know, definitely heightens that sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it isn't, of course, you know. I mean, it, let's not take away from real war zones, uh, but 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 it's it's a constant state of of uh, heightened activity um, that you know, Flint is one of the more violent places in America. It has very high crime stats, and when you are out there to either document it or or yeah. stop it, you know, to try to deal with it. Um, yeah, and it's, you got to be, you got to have what you need. You know, we had police scanners. We had we had people who, with the if the directors and the camera people were out shooting, we had somebody who was always on call just in case anything happened and we and we needed it. Of course, we talked to our insurance company and we talked to our, our lawyers and you know and made sure that there were you know things set up you know, in case. Yeah. But when you think of it, you kind of set that aside, you know. Well, um, I think what I want to point out here too, Gary, is I've worked as a camera operator on a number of reality TV series and being a viewer of this, and it was why, I'll be honest with you, initially I was a bit skeptical of the series when I saw sort of thumbnails of it and I read what is what it was about and I just thought, oh great, another reality TV series a la cops. And I couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, this is literally you're watching documentary film as a series. And that is something that I appreciated very much. This is not a reality TV series at all. Oh, I definitely know what you're saying. And in fact, thank you for just saying that. I think it's probably worth letting people know that maybe some of some of the blurbs uh, don't give. It, it's right. a tough one to describe. So, you know, I think the default is, oh, it's a TV. It's going to be another TV show about cops or process. Or, you know, we had a lot of discussions about is this, you know, pro do, do we want to follow process? Mm. 
meaning there's a crime. We learn what the evidence is. We follow the cops and the detectives and the detectives the, through the court system. And we're like, no. You know, Netflix was asking, well, if we see a dead body, you know, are we going to want to know who it is, who did it, you know, what the consequences are? And we eventually said, you know, no, that's not what it's about. It's not a process show. And it's not mm. even just about cops. You know, it's not about action. There is some action. Um, but, you know, you can see a, a show. And it's funny because cops came to Flint and they actually shot in Flint. And I don't think we were there when it was happening. It was happening oh, wow, during our hilarious. period of filming, but we didn't happen to – yeah, we didn't happen to be there when cops was there because they only come in for like you know a couple of days or a week, and you know like I said, and in the, in the, before the Netflix money came in, we were not there um, cons- consistently. Right. Anyway, right. we asked them how it was, and then the cops were like, "Yeah, yeah, they were they were cool. You know, their craft service was better than yours." <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. Which is, which is which is perfect, you know. But you know, then and cops watch cops. You know, they kind of like that. You know, totally. They, they, you know, you know, there's a little bit of an adrenaline junkie aspect. You know, you, you have to be a cop. But you're right. Early on, you know, plus we're not. We're not reality show filmmakers. We're documentarians. That's you right. Know, we we want to be serious and explore issues and, uh, and present those for discussion. You know, we're also not polemic filmmakers. Mm. You know, we didn't go in. Of course, we have our own personal opinions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we yeah. didn't go in and wanted to verify, if you will, which I think too many do, <laughs> our our personal opinions. Or in the case of a really honest filmmaker, go in to verify and then be honest about the fact that their preconceived notions yeah. shattered. You know, yeah. sometimes that happens. But we just said, look, let's just sort of keep that out of it. You know, I mean, it's hard to stay objective as a documentarian, mm. you know, even if you want to be objective, we all know that there's just some almost, if it's, even if it's subconscious level where you can't remain objective, but, right. um, but that's also where different voices help and, and, and different, you know, interviews and different, different, you know, both the police, the, the government, the citizens, that's right. The, you know, the fourth estate we had in, you know, we interviewed journalists. There's even a, a, a part of the show um, where we dive into a little bit more of one of the local TV news people. Oh, yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Just Jessica Dupnack. Which is great. And yeah. um, and so regardless of what our voice is, there's so many voices in this that it's going to be a mix. And which is what's uh, lovely about it. It's 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 amazing that you. way. I, I really appreciated that, Gary. There's something I wanted to ask you that you had you had mentioned uh, uh, earlier in this in this part of the conversation. You'd mentioned about Netflix um, Netflix coming in and, and asking about, hey, if there's a dead body, are, are you going to show it? And it makes me really want to ask you because I know my listeners will be curious about this. What um, what if any kind of influence did did Netflix have in terms of editorial decisions? Uh, how much input did they have? A lot, hmm. you know, a lot because, well, I mean, let's face it, they're paying for it, right? That's right. So, you know, whether we want them to have a lot or not, they're gonna they're gonna have a lot. Now, and this is, however, to their credit, you know, our executive producers on on the Netflix side, Adam and Lisa, I mean, they're amazing. They're filmmakers too. They they get the documentary world, and, and they're not they don't focus on the narrative shows at Netflix. You know they they compartmentalize. Uh-huh. So you're dealing, yeah. I mean the legal department would probably do both, and sure. the post production, but but the executive producers are you know they they have an intimate awareness of the type of content, or, or the type the type of show right. you know, that you're trying to whether it's you know Queer Eye for the Straight Guy is going to have a different executive producer from Netflix as Flint Town mm. as you know, as, as house of cards. So, um, you're working with people who you realize, you know, you're lucky to have them as creative partners. Uh, And at the same time, they've got a lot going on, as we all know, you know, with spending $6 billion on original production (laughs) and a lot of shows that they're keeping an eye on, but they respect, I think, you know, it seemed that they, they wouldn't have taken us on if they didn't, think we could do it and come up with something good and so we certainly have a lot of you know leeway to the point where you know we're gonna get something cut and and before we show it you know right and then we get some notes you know it's in a sense it's almost like a client you know on the commercial side of things it's Mm. like a filmmaker company client relationship you know they're paying they're paying for it but they hired you they hired you because they have faith in, in your vision 
and and they and they bought into you know your pitch and so we we cut we hired a team of editors and divvied up the episodes and, and then kind of the, the story producers and the showrunner and and the directors who also have executive producer credit are kind of you know at the higher level view and and they worked their tails off for months and yeah. months cut after cut and version after version and then at some point we'd show something to netflix and they they'd have notes you know and then they'd have thoughts, <laughs> they'd have conversations well and then, how did that go you know yeah, and some things we would think oh great and some things to be like well you know I'm not sure we, we agree with you there and then, of course there were internal you know discussions is exactly the same you yeah. know you the editor has an idea and then the director you know has a comment so in that sense you know long and short of it yes they they do have involvement and, and input but it is absolutely in service of the best product possible well let me ask you this then gary in terms of, you described earlier how the relationship, you know, a bit of uh, how the relationship came to be with 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 a company, one of the big, you know, if not biggest digital distribution platforms out there in Netflix. My question for you is, Gary, those those of those of us who are not connected or don't have maybe bigger connections or connections to connections to connections in the industry, how would you recommend? Um, and speak directly to my listeners here, Gary. How would you recommend somebody approach one of these platforms? How do you approach a Netflix, say, with an idea for a doc series? Or would you, in your experience now, maybe with with somebody, and I've described you know, our listenership, or would you instead maybe recommend, look, produce, produce the series first or produce a pilot and then approach him? Give us some ideas or some tips here, Gary. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, first off, there's two different ways to get your content on Netflix. One is like the latter that you just said, produce it yourself, pay for it, you know, through whatever means you can, whether it's, you know, Kickstarter or private equity or inheritance, whatever. Yeah. And then finish it. Certainly you have entire creative control at that point. And then you approach Netflix and you say, you know, would you guys put this you guys interested and that's just a licensing deal that's what happened with t-rex you know we produced t-rex independently and then we went to netflix and they said sure you know paid us a, a you know licensing amount mm. i've had narrative films that were on netflix in that sense it's not hard to get your content on netflix mm. it's probably getting a little harder because now they're they're trying to make room um a room is virtual but still you know um right there's only so much screen real estate for those thumbnails. <clears throat> so <laughs> they may be they may be taking on less content. You can read about that in the trades. It's no secret. But if you want to go the other route and you want it to be Netflix original or Amazon original yes. or an HBO project or whatever it is, you know, to be honest, it's hard. And, yeah. you know, we're fortunate. You know, you can't just call them up if you don't have either – a way in, a connection, a partner that already has blazed that trail and built that bridge. Yeah. Um, you know, which isn't to say that maybe a festival might be a way, mm. you know. Um, again, we're talking about something that's probably finished at that point, though, I guess. So, yeah, right, right. You know, unless it's a shorts festival or some festivals are now showing first and, you know, one or two one or two episodes of shows. We were hoping to do some of that as well, but when Netflix set our release date as March 2nd, oh. it just sort of took all of those opportunities, you know, off the table, which is fine. It's not like we needed the, the festival release, you know, for a pickup or, right. you know, to get, you know, or to build an audience. Yeah, there's no it's validation already, there needed. Right. Yeah. It's already going to be on Netflix. So, yeah. so my recommendation is decide early what you want it to be mm. and, and maybe where you want it to go. And if you want to try to get it on one of the streaming digital distribution channels that pays for things. I mean, certainly there's plenty of digital distribution out there that doesn't pay for things. You know, Vimeo, you know, has originals and things like this, but I don't think that they particularly we're not. Yeah. And, and that's not at all yeah. what we're talking about here. Anyhow. Yeah. Right. Right. So, right. The, the, right. The, the Holy Grail, whatnot. Yeah. Um, so, and like I said, we're lucky, you know, I mean, now that we're in, maybe it'll make the next one easier, but yeah, don't know, worse. you know, so we, I, I would recommend if that's where you want to go, mm. work every connection you have, you know, for us and from my personal experience, also trying to get a few TV sh ideas over the years, you know, picked up 
uh, maybe a travel show idea or, or cooking show idea. I mean, yeah. I've been involved in a couple of those things over the years. Um, you know, you maybe there's the markets, you know, the, the TV markets, um, you know, like, like there's film markets, you know, like AFM, there's TV markets. You can go and you have your poster and your one sheet and your, in your, in your business plan and your synopsis, your book essentially. And, you know, you maybe get, get some interest there. I'm not sure Netflix shops those so much as it's more Probably local not, TV yeah. stations and, and maybe networks, you know, yeah. but again, it's the same model, you know, mm. I mean, a network picks things up from independents all the time, but the most important thing is if you don't have a, yourself a track record, yes. a previously produced show, or someone on your team doesn't, it doesn't matter how successful you might be in another part of the industry. Like I think you know we're, we're relatively successful in the commercial industry. You know right, our names right, are out right. there. Agencies know who we are, and we've got a good body of work in that realm. But it doesn't mean it that much to them. So, and we even had a. A movie on Netflix, you know, we had T Rex on Netflix. Wow, now, right, right, right. Well, we're not. Who knows? Netflix is the only one who knows. But you know, we certainly can say, "Hey, we're the T Rex people." <laughs> we <We've> <laughs> like, of course, come on in. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've have... been waiting for you guys. <laughs> right. Find a, you know, so again, if all those connections and some of these other things they threw out there doesn't work, find a well-known, respected, established, successful production entity. Again. Easier said than done. Probably yes. at least a little easier though, and and see if you can get them to to partner up with you. Now you know anonymous wasn't going to throw money at it, you know. So, uh, but they were willing to you know team up, kind of go to bat then, for you, right? And then, and then provide you know, and then you know, and then if it if it got picked up and if the money came in, then of course they'll bring some resources to bear and whatnot. Uh, but they were willing to you know kind of go out on that ledge with us, right? And um, and you know, look, Netflix could have could have said no, and then we would have probably gone to probably maybe HBO next, and then maybe Amazon. But yeah. you know, we would have kept at it, right? Uh, and then we would have tried a network, and <laughs> we would have tried public television, and then we would have tried. You know, we would have just kept kept going, and it and it doesn't mean that our our next one, you know, will be on Netflix or. You know, or, or or somewhere else. I mean, that remains to be so. It's only been out for two weeks. You know, yeah, Flint exactly. Town's only been out for for two weeks. Well, Gary, now that you've gotten such a full on t uh, full on taste of documentary, and certainly in the long form genre, long form as a docu series, what does this do for you in terms of? Do you think you'll stay you'll stay doing some documentary? Is this or or is this a is this a one and done for you, or is documentary a thing for you now? That's a good question. I, I would certainly, I mean, Flint Town has, you know, we're, it's season one, hopefully, you know. Right. So um, I'm I'm on, you know, for the grace of the, the people I work with and, and since who hire me, you know, yeah. on Flint Town. You know, would I want to do others? I, I, absolutely I would. I mean, again, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, so... You know, I want to I want to be engaged with the content that I make, and of course, that doesn't happen with commercials quite so much. Interestingly, the corporate work that I do has a bit of a heart to it. It has a bit of documentary work to it, and that's absolutely it. We talk about that on yeah, the show it's a lot. Got yeah, it's got you know the Apple work we've done and Facebook and and some other corporate clients. It's like there's interviews, yeah. and we're telling people stories, and these are real people, you know, in their in their case studies, <clears throat> and. And I've been doing this stuff with with ZCDC, um, and it's it's tremendous. It's actually it's kind of to me it's the best of both worlds. I get mm. sort of the commercial level production and budgets, but we get to tell interesting, engaging, and even important stories. Yeah, and that's and that and that's super cool. So I'd have to say my I think my happy place would would be you know still doing the com straight commercial work. You know, occasionally get involved in some just amazing and powerful documentary stuff like like Flint Town, yeah. and then and then still keeping that combination where we're doing stories that are well funded. You know, uh, you know, I I I've always felt like of late anyway. You know, I'm the unexpected documentarian. You know, my whole career has been in commercials and the narrative features, and then out of nowhere, it just, just started shifting. <laughs> and, and, and now here I am and I, you know, I'm no authority on the subject, yeah. but I hope that it continues. 
Yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad that 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 we've got you, Zach and Dre and Jessica, as as uh, part of the ranks of documentary filmmakers. It's it's great. Flinttown is a a brilliant show, and uh, I uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. And I look forward to further seasons, absolutely, because uh, I need to know what what's happening with these characters. And as as any good sort of documentary does, it uh, not only broadens the scope uh, of 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 really the way that you you think about other people and other cultures. It um, it leaves you wanting for more, and it can and 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 this and in this case, Flint Town is very applicable to many sort of things um, that are happening, certainly in our lives here in the U.S. So, um, yeah, absolutely watch Flint Town, Gary. As we as we wrap this up, are there any sort of final words that you might have for for my listenership, who I, you know I described at the outset of the show, who they are, um, well acquainted with video and film, but this might be their first documentary film endeav- endeavor. Have you got any uh, words of wisdom you'd like to impart? Wow, that that the capper. Um, the capper. <laughs> I mean, again, you can say no. As, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not, I I like to be able to come up with one. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I I just say you know I, I'm I'm so impressed and, re- and and respectful for people in the documentary world, you know, because they are taking the tools that can be used for so many things. And in using it to tell important, meaningful stories, and you know, I, I hope that that for many out there that are struggling with the resources to finish their projects, or are dealing with creative challenges or technical challenges, that their need and desire to tell the story they realize is is a huge resource in and of itself, and to and to use that towards the completion of your project. We've been speaking with the producer of the new hit Netflix documentary series, Flint Town. Gary, what a lovely conversation. I'm so glad that we were able to make this happen, man. Likewise. Thank you so much, Chris. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.